Welcome to a new season of Clot Conversations from Thrombosis Canada. I'm David Airdrie, Executive Director. This season, we have a new addition to our team, Dr. Maha Othman from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She will be joining J Dr. Jamil Abduwayman from Toronto General Hospital as co-host. We're excited to have her on board, along with Jamil, to lead the interview discussions. Welcome to both of you. Great to be back. Thank you. I'm excited to be joining the podcast. In this podcast, we're here to provide you with updates on diagnosis and management of thrombosis, featuring interviews with authors of recent research publications and highlights of education programs from Thrombosis Canada. Thank you for joining us for this episode. In this episode, we'll be discussing a recent paper published in BMJ Open entitled Pile Pilot Trial Study Protocol, Tinsaparin Lead-In to Prevent the Post-Thrombotic Syndrome Study Protocol. And we are very pleased to have two of the co-authors with us today, Dr. Ilya Makedonov and Dr. Jean-Philippe Galano. Dr. Galano is a general internal medicine specialist and thrombosis physician. He works as a staff physician in the Department of Medicine at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto. He is also an associate professor of medicine at the University of Toronto, and his areas of research expertise are in post-thrombotic syndrome and DVT. He is currently conducting with Dr. Susan Kahn from McGill two multicenter studies in the field of post-thrombotic syndrome, one on the prevention with low molecular weight heparin, the TIRE study, and one on the treatment with venoactive drug, the MUFFIN study. And Dr. Mekhanadov, uh, who completed medical school at the University of Toronto, followed by internal medicine residency in Ottawa. He took a keen interest in thrombosis, doing a fellowship at Sunnybrook and receiving a grant from CanVector. His research has focused on the post-thrombotic syndrome, as well as distal DVT and cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. He runs a thrombosis clinic at the South Lake Regional Health Center. He has a broad clinical practice, including peripartum and cancer-associated thrombosis. And in his spare time, he bikes and snails, and he hopes to one day on a dog. Thank you both for participating in our podcast today, and let us get started with our questions. Perhaps if you can give us in the beginning some background on what is post-thrombotic syndrome. Yeah, of course, I'll answer uh, this one. Um, so, you know, to start with post-thrombotic syndrome is, is, um, is a form of chronic venous insufficiency um, that's caused by a prior clot in the same, the same extremity, same limb, um, same leg. Um, and that caused by different, multiple different mechanisms. Um, and they all come together to, to create venous insufficiency. One big mechanism is that the valves get damaged after a clot, um, in, in the veins. And those are very important to prevent backflow of blood down, down the leg. Um, and the bigger the clot, the more proximal it is, the more, the more damage it's gonna, it's gonna bring to that, to those valves. Um, and of course, the, the more damage has been done, the less chance of that valve recovering, even as the clot recedes and goes away and dissipates. That's why we tend to see, you know, the more proximal the clot, the iliac clots tend to have the highest risk of ETS down the road. Other, other, um, mechanisms are sometimes there is residual, um, venous obstruction. So oftentimes clots, you know, they scar down, um, they become chronic, but they don't fully go away in that scar tissue. And that again, reduces uh, venous return because now um, in the size of the, of the pipe is smaller, blood can't get up the leg as well. And all of that together um, leads to, again, venous insufficiency. And that comes out in many different ways, but um, some very common, you know, presenting symptoms would be a patient coming in saying, my leg is heavy. Um, you can have that heaviness even without edema. So some primary care practitioners might not realize that there is actually the post-thrombotic syndrome. Sometimes the leg gets really itchy, um, heavy, itchy, painful, especially after standing or a long day on their feet. And again, that's some of the subtler points. Uh, it doesn't always have to have edema, but often, often edema is, is a big part of it. Um, so the big swollen leg with uh, lots of reticular kind of lacy attic veins, especially more prominent towards the ankle, lower down, that's the classic appearance. Um, and as the, as it gets more serious, then the worst, the worst form of it is venous ulcers, because those often are 
very hard to heal. You have to have really high quality home care, high quality wrapping, dressing, though often very difficult for patients to follow through on that. Um, and then those can obviously become infected. Um, you know, we can get septic, but that's obviously a very small proportion of people with PTS, but that's the whole, the whole spectrum um, of, of, what it, of what it can be. So I, I just I fully agree with what uh, Ilya said, and I would just like to add that, of course, post-traumatic syndrome won't kill your patient, but it will make his life very difficult because post-traumatic syndrome is very frequent. It can happen uh, after a proximal DVT. We estimate the prevalence of post-traumatic syndrome to be 20 to 40%. Uh, but it's the uh, strongest predictor of impaired quality of life after a deep vein thrombosis. So it's something to keep in mind. Yes, it's not fatal. It won't be fatal, but it makes your life difficult. One thing I would add to that, actually, is that, you know, obviously, as Dr. Galeno was saying, by the book, you know, the, the incidence of it is 20 to 50 percent. But uh, I do wonder now... Uh, anecdotally, if that's overestimated, because in clinic, definitely don't see it, you know, in half of my patients, probably a bit less than that in real life. Well, thank you, both of you, for this very comprehensive uh, description. Clearly, it's uh, a condition that affects the quality of life. So there have been various attempts to decrease the risk of post-thrombotic syndrome, such as compression stockings or catheter-directed thrombolysis. Are these effective means of reducing the risk of post-thrombotic syndrome? Yeah, so I'll take that one. So thanks for asking. Um, so yeah, the classic teaching has been to, you know, prescribe elastic compression socks to, to reduce the risk of uh, of uh, developing PTS later on. Um, and that was based on a, a number of uh, kind of open label randomized trials that came out of Europe. Um, and um, the, the, the strong, strong part of that data is that they were randomized, which is good. But you know, the open label nature means that there was no placebo essentially. So people who were in the in the placebo in the non-sock group, they knew they had no socks. So that would definitely even subconsciously impact um, their assessment of their of their symptoms because there's again, there's no actual intervention. That's what an open label trial is. So um, those trials showed a benefit. All of them did these major European uh, RCTs. And then there was a landmark Canadian, you know, SOX trial. Lots of us are familiar with that. Dr. Khan was in charge of that. Uh, and, and actually, it did not show any, any improvement of reducing actually the risk of PTS or preventing it with compression sockings. And that was a bit disappointing to some of us, you know, who believe in these uh, treatments. Depends who you ask, how much uh, stock people put in that. But uh, some people, it was a big disappointment. Um, the only caveat, so that kind of put the final nail in the coffin for people being very dogmatic about demanding their patients wear socks up front to protect them. But the only caveat to that, one caveat to that is that the compliance wasn't that good to socks. Um, so, you know, only 55% wore the stockings more than three days per week. So some would argue that we need better, um, better patient buy-in for these trials, because again, the European trials had generally 80% plus uh, adherence. So so maybe it didn't work because, you know, uh, people didn't use them. Um, so that's kind of still a bit controversial because of that. Um, but it seems to be not a, not, not a silver bullet by any means. So it's not no longer kind of widely recommended by most thrombosis physicians up front, uh, again, to protect from PTS. The other, uh, the other interventions that, you know, you mentioned are, are catheter directed lytics. Uh, no one does really systemic uh, thrombolysis so far as I know for, just um, just reducing the risk of PTS because the risk of bleeding is very high. Um, but uh, people definitely do catheter-directed uh, lytics, just kind of putting a catheter, you know, in the appropriate spot next to the clot. Um, there's been three major trials kind of focusing on that. Um, kind of chronologically, it was, you know, CAVE and T, ATTRACT, and then CAVA. Um, you know, um, CAVE and T did have a, reduction in PTS, but the other two did not. Um, putting it all together, there was a meta-analysis recently. It showed a, a relative risk of about 84 of developing PTS with catheter-directed lytics. So about a 16% reduction only in the risk of PTS. So it's not a major benefit. It seems to help more if the clot is 
larger and more proximal and more extensive. So those giant iliac clots, it's going to do more good for you than, you know, you're not going to do it for just a popliteal clot pretty much because the risk of PTS is low. Um, on the downside is that the relative risk of a major bleed is much, much, much higher than, than without uh, catheter directed lytics. Uh, relative risk is about 2.03 from a recent meta-analysis. So it's about a 200% chance of major bleeding, only gaining a 16% reduction in risk of PTS. So doesn't seem to be worth it for most patients unless the leg is really in bad shape. Um, again, with a large proximal clot. So I think most physicians don't tend to do prescribe this or look into it for their patients that often, uh, except for specific cases. Of course, if they have, you know, phlegmatious, really a dolence, that will be a different uh, case altogether if there's compromised, you know, viability of the tissue, but that's not for PTS purposes. Um, so overall, to summarize, I guess the other interventions that for preventing haven't really panned out, including uh, compression socks, which is very ambiguous, like I described, and lytics only seem to work for the biggest of the clots for only a small percent of patients, because only about 9% of patients actually have iliac clots. The rest are all smaller downstream clots. Okay, great. Uh, so now you made us very curious to hear about the TILE study. Could you tell us about it and what are the objectives? Thank you. So the TILE study is an open-label assessor-blinded multicenter study assessing if a therapeutic dose of subcutaneous tinzaparin, a low molecular weight heparin, given for three weeks, followed by uh, rivaroxaban 20 mg daily, is superior to a conventional treatment with oral rivaroxaban, so 15 mg BID for three weeks, followed by rivaroxaban 20 mg daily, in preventing post-thrombotic syndrome with, in patients with the first episode of acute common femoral or iliac deep vein thrombosis. For the main study, the primary outcome will be a post-thrombotic syndrome assessed at two years. And now we are currently doing a pilot trial and we will assess post-thrombotic syndrome at six months. All patients will be treated with anticoagulant treatment for at least three months as per international guidelines. And we'll have follow-up visit at 10 days, three weeks, three months and six months for the pilot study. And after six months, every six months in the main trial. So with the lead in the flow of liquid heparin, you said it would be 21 days. How did you decide on a 21-day lead-in with low liquid heparin? Yeah, so so good question. Um, so... Um... So a couple of reasons. Um, one is um, kind of mechanistic. It's that, um, you know, we're trying to target the, the phase when the inflammation and the inflammatory response is the greatest because the thinking, as we'll talk later, is that um, heparins help have some anti-inflammatory properties. And uh, the BioSox study um, did show that that inflammatory response of all the markers is really the highest in the first about three weeks to one month. Um, so that seems to be the time to target. You don't want to go too long because, you know, patients will not want to take an injectable for too long. Um, the second reason is that uh, that's exactly the point that you switch from rivaroxaban from the twice uh, daily dosing to the once daily dosing, three weeks. So it seems to line up on a pragmatic level with the rivaroxaban transition, as well as with the, the inflammatory response. So the study is looking at low molecular weight heparin decreasing the risk of post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, how would that work on a physiological level? What is the mechanism? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so um, interestingly enough, um, you know, heparins actually do have a, a long track record of, of having some anti-inflammatory properties, um, which has been, you know, tested in different other illnesses too, not just uh, clotting. Apparently there have been applications to try it with inflammatory bowel disease, with, you know, inflammatory lung disease. So this is not a new um, concept. Um, but more specifically, you know, um, they're actually heparins are biologically derived products. So they do come from, you know, pig and cow intestines pretty much. So they presumably have some kind of function in there to protect the mucosa uh, naturally. And uh, they, they target many different parts in the pathway of inflammation that's really active in those first couple of weeks and, and a clot as well. Just some examples, you know, they, um, they inhibit the tissue uh, factor pathway. Um, they also block P-selectins, which are all kind of pro-inflammatory molecules. They inhibit 
lymphocytes that are working around the clot, chemokines, uh, they decrease fibroblast proliferation, endothelial activation. Um, and animal models kind of moving down from just lab data to animal models, they also corroborate that because clots seem to be smaller when you expose them to low molecular to heparins. Um, there's less extravasation at the clot site, suggesting the inflammatory response is not as great around that clot. And they also accelerate the formation of new endothelium, which again, protects those valves and kind of makes that vein heal faster. And they reduce fibrosis, which is scar tissue, which we don't want because again, that leads to residual venous obstruction. Uh, and lastly, there seems to be actually even a dose response effect. So which suggests that it's actually some biologic uh, response as opposed to, you know, more of a coincidence. Um, if you guys are interested, uh, there was a, a very comprehensive uh, review on this that uh, we also put out on the on the biological mechanisms of inflammation. Came out a couple of years ago. Uh, you can find it with our names. Um, but yeah, definitely to recap, multiple pathways are blocked, and they seem to be seem to be possibly more active in terms of anti-inflammatory properties than DOEX. Um, there's more research on them for sure. Uh, the last point to raise, you know, it, it kind of focuses on why we chose tins of Um, There was a, just one theoretical, again, lab research paper. It wasn't clinical, but it was uh, Stella Salta in 2018. Uh, they compared kind of different DOEX and different anticoagulants. And uh, tins of parent did seem to have a bit more anti-inflammatory properties uh, by inhibiting thrombin uh, more than the other uh, comparators, kind of delaying clot formation and also reducing the maximal clot firmness. Uh, so that seems to be the basis for this specific uh, low molecular weight heparin that we chose. So what did prior studies show regarding the use of various anticoagulants on the um, risk of post thrombotic syndrome? I'll kind of break it down into two parts. First, I'll talk about um, low molecular weight heparins, then I'll talk about DOAX. And uh, all of these studies, the comparator tends to be kind of warfarin because that has been for a long time the gold standard. Um, and the last thing to know, there sadly isn't any head, head comparisons between TTS rates and, and low molecular weight heparin and DOEX. That's kind of the one big hole in the data. But starting with low molecular weight heparin, um, there have been kind of, again, um, a lot of, a few studies. Um, but only, only about four, four big ones had um, clinical outcomes. A few of them focused just on the, uh, the ultrasound findings that I talked about, but, uh, but four big ones talked about um, the actual rates of PTS and heparins compared to uh, warfarin. Uh, the biggest one was the home light study by Hall, actually came out of Canada in 2009. Um, the good thing about that study, it was a multi-center RCT. And again, compared, um, Tins of parent actually at a full therapeutic dose for 12 weeks to, to a vitamin K antagonist. It had a very good, good, I would say in this field, a good patient size. There were 480 patients, 240 in each arm. And um, uh, it found a significantly reduced risk of uh, PTS odds ratio of 0.77, um, which again, that way even seems to be better than catheter directed lytics, just comparing those two numbers alone at 12 weeks for, uh, for reducing the risk of PTS. Um, it was significant. Um, there was some surprising, really strong findings, like the rate of ulcers was was 0.5% in the heparin group compared to 4.1 in the warfarin arm. And that was, you know, only at one year. So that was an interesting kind of very optimistic finding. But uh, the other studies have also been there. A lot of them weren't significant. Some had kind of clinical scales that we don't use as much, but this was the biggest one, the home light study, uh, but it definitely served as a big foundation for our work. Um, in terms of now the DOAX for reducing the risk of PTS, there's a lot of data there, but it's very low quality for the most part. By that, I mean, it's kind of retrospective studies. There's lots of registry-based studies that kind of pull, pull codes from, um, you know, health insurance databases and, you know, Diagnosing PTS with a code is very hard because how do you know it's not baseline venous insufficiency, um, especially by the time it gets to the coding people. So that's kind of a lot of a lot of people uh, studies are based on that. Um, there's some 
the most promising study, I would say, as far as DOAX and uh, PTS reduction, it just came out a couple of years ago. I, um, let me find it. Yeah. So RSA Al, it came out in uh, 2019. It was actually the first randomized trial of just looking at DOAX for preventing the risk of PTS compared again um, just to warfarin. But um, it had a remarkable um, result, I would say. Um, the rate of PTS was um, uh, 29 percent in the warfarin arm and nine percent only in the DOAC arm. So that was very impressive. And the other interesting thing is they had very good control of the INR um, um, in their group. So you can't blame you know people being subtherapeutic for the high rates of PTS. Um, so definitely DOAC seemed to be getting more and more studies on reducing the risk of PTS, but not yet as many trials as uh, low molecular weight heparins have. Thank you. So this is a pilot trial. Uh, can you tell us what that means and the importance of pilot trials in general? So a pilot study is a small study to test research protocols, data collection instruments, sample recruitment strategies, and other research techniques in preparation for a larger study. A pilot study is one of the most important stage in a research project and is conducted to identify potential problem areas and deficiencies in the research instruments and protocol prior to implementation during the full study. For TILE, the main reason to conduct a pilot study are to assess if the study is feasible in terms of recruitment and to assess the magnitude of the difference in the rates of PTS in each group to determine the sample size of the future large-scale study. So we had talked about open-label studies before in which the participants are aware of which study arm they're assigned to. Uh, the challenge with that is that with subjective outcomes, it might bias their awareness or um, its presentation of the symptoms. Um, so the tile study is open label design. Are you taking any precautions to account for this? Yes, it's true that the gold standard in such research would have been to conduct a double blind uh, trial, but uh, it's much more complicated to do. And uh, we have to keep in mind because it would mean that doing a double blind study that patients will receive an injectable placebo. So they will receive an injection that they, uh, that could not for nothing on a practical point of view because they are not getting the uh, injectable low molecular weight heparin. But we have to keep in mind that in tile, the PTS assessment, uh, uh, which can be prone to a placebo or rather an injection effect, will be assessed at six months in the pilot study and at two years in the main study, which is long after the patient has been treated with tinzaparin, which means that it's very likely we expect that the patient will have forgotten that they were receiving injection for three weeks more than five months ago. Um, and furthermore, also investigators who will assess patients for clinical signs of post-thrombotic syndrome will not be aware of patient treatment arm, which will limit uh, such a bi of bias that we are not double blind. Yeah. And it is a multi-center study. So we're curious to hear from you. What are the challenges of conducting such a multi-center study? So the main challenge is that we need to enroll patients at the very acute phase of their DVT when inflammation is at its peak and when low molecular weight heparin are the most likely to be more effective when there is a lot of inflammation. So we need to enroll patients uh, that have started to be symptomatic on a DVT standpoint uh, for less than 10 days. Furthermore, the enrollment window is very short uh, after the DVT is diagnosed because we do not want patients to receive for too long uh, other anticoagulation treatment than the study drug. Patients need to be randomized no later than 20, 72 hours before being started on anticoagulant. Furthermore, most patients are not aware nor do not realize how devastating post-thrombotic syndrome can be in the very long term. They have, most of them have never heard about post-thrombotic syndrome. And some of them may be scared about receiving an injection or are scared about inject 
treating themselves. And they may prefer being treated with an oral medication than receiving an injection because they are not aware of what is post-traumatic syndrome and because they may be scared of uh, receiving an injection. So that's the main challenge that we have in the in the, in the TILE study. Yeah, I see. Well, one of the things you listed in the protocol is that two patient partners were involved in the design and conduct of the trial. Could you explain to us the value and contribution of patient partner engagement in these types of studies? Oh, so participation of patients' partner is essential in research because thanks to their own experience, they always make some critical suggestion when we design the studies. They are able to say, oh, you know, there are too many procedures. Patients won't attend this procedure. It's too complicated. It's too burdensome. Furthermore, when we develop the patient's material, they are able to help us to say, oh, it's too complicated. It's not written in lay language. And so they make some critical suggestion on how to write the patient's material. For the tile study, we have the great chance of having Mr. Uh, Christopher Dennis and Mrs. Uh, Jessica Zambito as patient's partner and their contribution to the to the study is just fantastic. It's, uh, it's, I don't think that uh, conducting research nowadays without patient's partner is a good thing because it's so great to have them on board. Fully agree. Yeah. All right. So is there anything that we haven't discussed today that you would like to add? Yes, so with Susan Kahn, who is co-PI of the project with me, uh, I would like to thank all the people that are helping us in this project. For sure, Ilya, uh, Dr. Makadenov for helping in publishing the protocol and the literature review. All the centers uh, that are participating uh, in the protocol and their, uh, and their study personnel. We have on board uh, UHN, McMaster, Ottawa Hospital, the Jewish General Hospital and Sunnybrook the Can Vector Network and Thrombosis Canada for their invaluable help in promoting the study, as well as Leo Pharma with the special thanks to uh, Rhonda Leader for supporting the study. And of course, all the patients that have agreed to participate so far in the study. Thank you very much to all of them. Well, thank you both so much for educating us about this interesting study. And thanks, Jamil, for uh, co-hosting this uh, podcast with me, and I'm so excited to be doing this for the first time. Yes, thank you to uh, both of you and to David for, for doing this, uh, this uh, very nice uh, podcast. Well, and thank you, everybody, for, for participating today. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in to Clot Conversations from Thrombosis Canada. We welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions on the podcast. And if you have any recommendations for future podcasts, ideas about topics or papers, please send them to us at info at thrombosiscanada.ca. And please subscribe to this podcast so that you're notified about the release of new episodes. Check out the 22 episodes we've already uh, put in the can, so to speak. And don't forget to check out our website for education programs, clinical tools, and guides. And also, please consider donating to Thrombosis Canada to support our ongoing efforts to reduce morbidity and mortality due to thrombosis. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you.